start with one of the coolest people in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Uh, I knew someone wow. who, was, who was once considered the least known smartest person. You're the least known coolest person, but we're going to fix that today. Uh, this is Arthi Prabhakar, uh, who is director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Is that right? That's Arthi? exactly yeah, that's right. right. So I, I guess I wanted to start off somewhat comically, I guess, and just ask you if you're really responsible for Captain America in, in addition to the Internet. <laughs> Um, we, we try to take credit for all the good things in the world, but I, I think that, that would probably be a little bit of a but You stretch. are the place, I mean, the British, I mean, it's, it's bad to refer to James Bond since he's on the British side of things, but you imagine exploding pens and technology that's used in national security issues that you're the home base of that in America, of, of the cool gadgets, the cool computers, the cool technology. Well, th those are some of the things that come out of our research. What we're responsible for is preventing and creating technological surprise for national security. Uh, and there's a chapter that, that delineates this marvelous story of how the internet went from a research project to something that changed our, all of our lives. Uh, and I started reading it out loud to my husband, who had actually been a staffer for Al Gore, and, and I, I, it was just so wonderful to see that story come out loud and clear. It was terrific. Now, I dug in, did some research, and realized, because I wondered, if you're president of the United States, what's one of the first things you would do? You would go see the place that makes all the cool gadgets, right? But I understand President Obama has not visited your facility and checked in, but Hillary Clinton loved to drop by. Oh, is that true? I don't oh, even know oh, that. Uh, That's that, oh, oh, not while I've been there. Oh, 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 so which Clinton? Uh, I don't know the answer oh, no to that. Clinton. Okay. No, I, mean, I think what uh, you have to realize is we are this minuscule part of this much larger research and development enterprise. We're a minuscule part of the Defense Department. We get to do, our mission allows us to do these amazing things, and it's actually only because people in, in my chain of command up to the president actually understand our mission and give us room to so do it. Define so define your mission for us support. because we've been talking about the sort of fun things, but actually yeah. you in the national security realm, you, you have objectives out there, you have a, a very key role. DARPA is, is you know, for, for, for hitting above its weight for, for budget, one of the most known and respected institutions in advance. Uh, and there's a chapter that, that delineates this marvelous story of how the internet went from a research project to something that changed our, all of our lives. Uh, and I started reading it out loud to my husband, who had actually been a staffer for Al Gore, and, and I, I, it was just so wonderful to see that story come out loud and clear. It was terrific. Now, I dug in, did some research, and realized, because I wondered, if you're president of the United States, what's one of the first things you would do? You would go see the place that makes all the cool gadgets, right? But I understand President Obama has not visited your facility and checked in, but Hillary Clinton loved to drop by. Oh, is that true? I don't oh, even know oh, that. Uh, That's that, oh, that, oh, not while I've been there. Oh, 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 so which Clinton? Uh, I don't know the answer oh, no to that. Okay. No, I, mean, I think what uh, you have to realize is we are this minuscule part of this much larger research and development enterprise. We're a minuscule part of the Defense Department. We get to do, our mission allows us to do these amazing things, and it's actually only because people in, in my chain of command up to the president actually understand our mission and give us room to so do it. So define your mission for us support. because we've been talking about the sort of fun things, but actually yeah. you in the national security realm, you, you have objectives out there, you have a, a very key role. DARPA is, is you know, for, for, for hitting above its weight for, for budget, one of the most known and respected institutions in advanced technology in the world. So how do you define what your mission is? Yeah, our, our mission traces back to our founding, and the trigger event for that was in 1957 when human beings put the first ever artificial satellite on orbit. That was mm. Sputnik. And the only problem was, of course, that the human beings who did that were, were the Soviets at the height of the Cold War. And so that was a very unpleasant surprise in the United States. I actually think this country did a, a, a range of really smart things to respond. And one of them was to create DARPA, initially the Advanced Research Projects Agency, this little place tucked away in the Defense Department. And so our job from the very beginning was to prevent that kind of technological surprise. And then, you know, very quickly, the people who started the agency realized that the way you prevent surprise is you go create some surprises of your own. And that's from that core mission came these decades of investment that led to a transformation in how the military fights through stealth technology and precision strike and many other underlying components. We also invested in these enabling 
core technologies that led to the internet, that led to a lot of the great advances that are, that, that are, that are the foundation for what's happened in the semiconductor industry, uh, in artificial intelligence and advanced materials. We did those for national security, but you know, a few other people got in the game and, and as the private capital drove those technologies forward, they not only changed how we fight, but they've changed how we live and work. You know, Andy Marshall, who, who many people affectionately called Yoda, who was the net assessment uh, chief at the Pentagon for many years, was obsessed with Chinese obsession about what they called the revolution in military affairs. And, and the revolution in military affairs, as I saw it, they saw it, was primarily what DARPA was doing to change the games of war, to create smart soldiers, to synthesize information and communication in ways right. that hadn't been there. So. Uh, how much of Chinese paranoia was correct that you've changed the game? Well, in uh, so just to be clear, I, DARPA sparked a lot of that, right. but as with everything else, what we did was we showed what was technologically possible, and then, of course, it took the rest of the Department of Defense and our military service members and the Defense Industrial Base. All of that came together and created this military capability. The whole world, the Chinese, but everyone else as well, really saw what that was all about in the first Gulf War. Uh, that was uh, a time when we had built these capabilities to counter a far, uh, you know, numerically superior Soviet Union. We built all of that technology for the Fulda Gap, which fortunately was not a place that we ended up fighting. But in 1991, when we went into Baghdad, we were going, for example, we were going up against air defense systems that were based on that Soviet model. So it was, mm -hmm. it was in essence, what we had designed against. And I think that until that moment, I don't think we really knew if, if our investments were going to pay off. We could, it, that could have been a very long air campaign going right. into Baghdad, a long, drawn-out war of attrition. And instead, we flew hundreds of sorties uh, and took out their air defense system very efficiently and owned the skies and, and um, really just demonstrated this overwhelming advantage based on these core technologies that have been developed over a few years. So, you know, I think that's actually, I think for many of us, that's still the picture we have of what U.S. military superiority looks like. And it, it, uh, it, we still have this notion about being able to operate far from home against a fairly sophisticated adversary, as that was at the time, uh, and being able to do whatever we need to do with minimal losses. And I think it's important to say that was awesome, that was really good, it wasn't an accident we could do that, and now it's 20 years later and everyone around the world has seen exactly how we do that, and nothing, you know, any of these big advances are only fleeting uh, opportunities uh, for that kind of offset. So where we are today in the Department of Defense is, is exactly at that point coming out of a decade and a half of ground war, uh, thinking about this issue of how do we deal with where advanced military capability is now. It's not where it was in 1991. Adversaries have access to amazing global technology. What's, you know, what's our next move that, right. that leaps ahead of that? Any chance you can share with us some super secret next thing that you haven't shared with anyone else? N no. Okay. Um, just want <laughs> I mean, to get that out of the so way. Just to be clear, yeah. if it's classified, obviously we can't talk about it. But, th but there are some really powerful ideas uh, brewing about what this next offset strategy could be. This is something that's being driven from the most senior levels within the department. But, uh, you know, I think the core ideas have to... We're not going to turn the clock back to a time when the U.S. Mm. has all the secret sauce and no one else gets yeah. to play, right? So our question is how well, you Well, the question turn is the gap, right? So the gap, exactly. I mean, you know, you, you have, you know, t tangible feel for what we're investing in resources, what, what we're going to do in cyber, what sorts of yeah. smart soldiers will look like in the future. And I think the question is, as I, as I hold an iPhone here, is when you look at what's happened with technology globally and what has happened just with innovators in the United States, I assume the gap between the super secret stuff you're doing and what can be done outside your shop has narrowed over the years. Does that worry you? Well, and how do you see. deal with it? N number one, I think uh, w what you're talking about is the effect of both globalization of technology right. and the fact that it, we used to be, uh, for example, in this country, two-thirds of the country's research and development investment used to come from the government and one-third from the private sector. Now that's flipped, so two-thirds is from the private sector, only a third from government, of which we're only a piece. So those are 
I think those are trends that are very important. Most of the implications, I think, are great. It's a better world when technology is alleviating poverty around the world and creating opportunity and connecting right. us. And it's a better world when our private sector is driving technology and becoming this much more innovation-intensive uh, economy. I think those are great things. The implications for national security are pretty significant. And, I, and so I think the secret to success here is not to try to build a wall, it's not to try to you know, create non-obtainium uh, and do something mm. magic that's out beyond. I think that the secret to success is going to be to harness that commercial technology and turn it into military capability much more powerfully than anyone else can. One of the interesting things about Arthi Prabhakar is when I knew you in the 1990s, you were the head of NIST, the National that's Institute right. for Standards and Technology. Um, which often dealt with the private sector yeah. side of this and interacting with universities, creating cooperative research and development, and just a, a broader range of, of bridging the gap between various technology pools, oftentimes with the national labs and the private sector. I, I guess one of the questions I want to ask you, and maybe you can give me a short form answer, is should we be worrying about the ecosystem for technology innovation in this country as we've always known it? Should we just be relying on Google to go invent the next things? But is there a broader worry you have about the health and vitality of the ecosystem yeah. for innovation? No, I, I, for, I, I think maybe not worry, but I think we should never take it for granted. It is that uh, community that creates technology advances is what drives our economy. It's what keeps our country secure. It's what allows us to live longer and to have reliable, secure energy. None of that happens without our technology ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem, it's not static, it keeps changing. I think it's actually great to see Google and others who have the foresight and the resources to invest in research, but you know, I think we need to realize that it, as it's been throughout history, there are public roles and there are private roles and we wanna make sure that we keep that balance with the basic research, with the product development. You know, I asked Walter Isaacson what he would ask you if you were up here and he said, Talk to Arthi about cyber. Yeah. Uh, we recently, I was in a forum with Mike Rogers, who's the head of Cyber Command in the National Security Agency, uh, who says this is something we really need to double down on, we need to think, and those adversaries that are out there challenging us, be they states like Russia or China, uh, that we need to develop a kind of new architecture of deterrence. So I guess my two-part question on cyber is, is there a way to go from your shop on the offense on cyber, and how do you think about Cold War analogies mm, coming into that space? Yeah, well, let me tell you how, what our role is in the cyber world. First of all, everyone's in the cyber issue because every one of us that has networks or needs information technology to do our daily jobs, which is pretty Have much all of us. Have you guys been hacked? Has of ARPA course. been hacked? I've been hacked. You've been hacked. I mean, we've all... But we how about DARPA under, itself? Of course. Yeah, we're okay. under constant attack, as, huh. as is pretty much all of the Defense Department, but as, as our commercial companies as well. So that's, you know, nothing marvelous going okay. on there. The, I think the what we how we all deal with it today is patch and pray. We're finding mm -hmm. vulnerabilities and patching them as quickly as we can, and that's why we talk about hiring more cyber warriors to try to do that faster. And that's, a, that's all we've got, so we mm -hmm. should be doing that. The DARPA question there is can, the, the, the threat is go, growing at the pace that information technology is growing. That is a mm -hmm. phenomenal pace, right? Think about the amount of data, think about our continued growth and our reliance on information systems. All of that comes with more attack surface, more vulnerability. The DARPA question is, can we outpace the growth of those vulnerabilities? Can we find foundational approaches that will take whole classes of vulnerabilities off the table? Mm. Can we find ways of, of cyber defense that will scale be, but faster than hiring more cyber warriors? And so the, our programs are along those lines. So one of the things you hear a lot about these days is the Internet of Things, as more right. and more mm -hmm. devices get connected. Think about our cars. There's been a lot in the news lately about uh, the vulnerabilities of automobiles. Uh, the Defense Department is chock full of everything we have, has processors in it, virtually all of them connect in some way to the rest of the world. So we, this is a big problem for us too. One of our programs, as an example, is uh, building, taking some basic, really beautiful fundamental math and scaling it so that you can build embedded processors. So not huge amounts of code, but sort of manageable amounts of code. Uh, but build it in a way that's provably secure. It's mathematically provably secure. It can't be 
hacked for specified security properties. Now, you know, that changes the game. If you're an attacker, that's a lot less attractive place for you to spend your time, and maybe you'll go bother somebody else, and we can start creating mm. a little safer environment where, where it's really critical. Did any of you see the movie Transcendence with Johnny Depp? I'm a big Johnny Depp fan. I'm going to confess right now. Any of you see Transcendence? Yeah, so sitting out in the audience, just like you were, was a cameo of Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk, of course, of SpaceX and, and uh, Tesla. Yeah. And Elon has been out there worried, uh, as the movie worries about, the, the advances in artificial intelligence, the advances in robotics, the, a kind of turbocharged Internet of Things where people become less and less part of the, the equation. Uh, Bill Joy some years ago wrote uh, about right, the yeah. advances in, my, in, in computing and nanotechnology, et cetera, were, were creating new risks. And I'm interested, given the role you're at, are there, are there things that we should be worried about, that, that, that Elon Musk is not crazy, uh, that there are things that we should be thinking about as we propel ourselves into this new world of a very different association between non-human stuff? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, if you're going to work on powerful technologies, you have to be aware that with every one of those advances comes the opportunity for, for great new possibilities, great new capabilities.